The problem with globalization is that it it breaks down that relationship between capital and labor. That that for capitalism to work well, what you actually have to have, have happening, the secret sauce is that the way to make the most profit possible is to use the workers you have with you productively. And when that actually happens, we, we sort of see it as a, a mutual dependence. It, it can indeed accrue to everybody's benefit. When you when you sever that and you say, um, actually, I mean, the workers don't have anywhere to go. I guess they, well, they can't. But even if they could move to China and work as, you know, Chinese serfs, I'm not sure that would be to their benefit. Uh, but capital, by all means, go find other workers. You're, it's really the antithesis of capitalism. It's mm -hmm. not the highest form. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment, and this week it is just me again. I promise you will get Nick back. We have not sent him uh, to where the prairie dogs go. I don't know. Um, but uh, we had a fantastic episode today, and you're not seeing double. It's actually with Oren Cass again. We've done a double feature. We actually... Uh, locked him up in the studio with us for like three hours uh, a week or two ago. Uh, and the reason was is because they just keep on producing amazing stuff at American Compass. And whereas last week was about their big feature they did on immigration, this week is another sort of magnum opus tying it all together because American Compass is releasing a new book called Rebuilding American Capitalism, which is basically their overview on what must be done, uh, an imaginative conservative economic policy agenda for the 21st century. Um, that's my words, not theirs. Um, they're actually hosting an event about this that you should go to. Go to americancompass.org. The event that they're hosting is, I believe, on June 21st. Uh, and this episode is releasing before that very intentionally to help promote that event. Um, go check out the book. Go check out the event. You can go to their website to sign up for it. We'll be there. And be sure to check out the entire compendium. We were able to do a, a surface level analysis of all the different elements of it about responsive politics, how to actually give people a political economy that they want in America. We talked about productive markets and how there are changes that need to be made on policy when it comes to globalization, when it comes to financialization, and when it comes to industrial policy. We talked about supporting communities and what you can do on family policy, on labor, and on education. And uh, we made plenty of pot shots at silly libertarians along the way. Again, Oren's one of our favorite public policy thinkers in Washington, D.C. There's a reason why he's one of our chief speakers on our lecture series AM Fridays, which you should sign up for if you're an intern or junior staffer in DC this summer. Be sure to go to AmericanMoment.org to find out about that. He is our North Star on so many issues. Um, so be sure to enjoy this episode, a rare uh, double feature back to back, uh, just because uh, the world needs more Orin Cast content out there and we are more happy, uh, more than happy to oblige. So we'll go now to Orin Cast to talk about how we rebuild American capitalism. <laughs> Warren, thank you for coming back on the podcast again. Always available. Yeah, as 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 one might be able to notice by us wearing the the same same shirts and suits, uh, we we are taping this after we taped our fantastic episode on immigration, or we dived deep into a recent collection that American Compass has published. But being an extraordinarily prolific organization. It has something else really cool this summer that we thought was really important to talk about, which is uh, its magnum opus of, of uh, three years now of existence, uh, a, a book called Reclaiming American Capitalism. Is that right? It's rebuilding American Rebuilding. Capitalism. Sorry, I got it wrong. That's why we, I asked. We worked a lot. You spent a long time <laughs> workshopping the exact yeah. gerund there. So. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about what this book is about and why you guys have decided to make it now. Yeah, sure. Well, I should say, even if we'd filmed this at another time, I would probably be wearing the same shirt and jacket. <laughs> but you are more sartorially advanced than I am. I appreciate it. Um, you know, rebuilding American capitalism, as you said, is this effort to sort of bring together the work that we've done over the past three years that was essentially the mission in, in launching Compass in a lot of ways to build this foundation for conservative economics and a way for conservatives to really reclaim economic policy from the libertarians who have been driving it into the ground in recent decades. Um, but to do that in a way that actually works from first principles and isn't just sort of a politically responsive slapdash set of things, but builds from here's the foundation of, of how to think about what we want from the economy, 
Um, here are the issues we therefore really need to focus on, the problems that demand our attention, and then here is a comprehensive agenda um, that whether you were hypothetically running a presidential campaign or were an elected member of Congress or were just a guy who likes talking at the bar about public policy, uh, the the kinds of things you might focus on. Yeah. What, what is your assessment of the public policy slash political environment we find ourselves in? What, one of the things that that I've started saying a lot is anyone who's in our line of work, which is trying to create ideological paradigm shift in American politics, like it's been like eight years <laughs> since like Trump got elected. Like, we, 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 And it's always important to sort of reflect on the point on the timeline we're in now. What is your assessment of the state of affairs? Um, are you black pilled? Are you white pilled? Any something in between? <laughs> Tell <laughs> I me can do. never remember that. I can never even get blue and red pill yeah. right. Um, so I will I will avoid taking any of them for now anyway. Um, you know, my assessment is that we're at a, a simultaneously very frustrating and exciting moment, um, an American moment, if mm. you will. Um, <laughs> but but a really a really important and necessary step in the process, which is that the the sort of the the dead consensus, as some people like to call it, the kind of dominant orthodoxy of the old right um, really is gone. Um, there just aren't a lot of people, you know, there are still entire institutions with large endowments dedicated to writing op-eds about it, but there aren't a whole lot of people either sort of who intend to be relevant to conservative right of center politics in the future, um, as elected officials who are coming up as newer policy analysts, writers, journalists, lawyers, whatever, um, who, who take that stuff especially seriously. It's kind of a fun punchline. You kind of like get some, you know, smirks when you do have the guy who's still saying it. Um, and, and so that's that's just a vital first step. You, you have to be able to clear the space for new thinking. The consequence of that, though, is that you then have this kind of open season on new ideas, which is which is fun and and it's important, but it also looks totally chaotic. Um, and it can look like a movement with no direction. And to your point about sort of thinking back on the timeline, you know, Trump's success in the Republican primary and then ultimately winning the election was an incredible starting point in breaking down the the old consensus. Although even then, I think it was really only broken down politically, right? At that point, there was a consent, there, there was a recognition that the things you thought you had to say to win an election weren't necessarily the right things. There were an awful lot of people, though, who still thought like, okay, but the things we always thought we were supposed to do are still the things you're supposed to do. Yeah. We're a working class party, I say, as we pass another <laughs> carried interest tax uh, yes, level. Yes, well, that, that's right, right. And that's where, like, therefore, TICJA should be like the main accomplishment of our, you know, the the first c Congress. Um, but part of what I think Trump set off by creating that political space was people starting to do the work of saying, like, wow, what's going on here? Right. Like, how do we understand who all of these tens of millions of people are who clearly are so frustrated by the direction of the country, even though our GDP measure says things look good? Like, oh, let's actually learn about what the China shock is. Like, <laughs> let's let's discover what the data on the opioid epidemic actually says, et cetera. And, and so you started to have that intellectual process of saying there, there is an actual substance here um, and, and we do need to build something new. And so I think by the time you got to 2020, and the pandemic played a role in this, but you don't even have a Republican platform. I think it would have been virtually impossible to draft one. Um, and then in 2022, you have a party that can't run on anything substantive really in the midterms. You have exactly your point, that sort of vague, like, we are now a working class party sense. But if you'd actually tried to put forward like, a, and here is our contract with America or whatever, it, there's nothing that everybody would have agreed on. Mm -hmm. And I think you see this to some extent, you know, Senator Rick Scott, like, tried to, and it just immediately blew up in his face. Mm -hmm. Um, and and so I think that rightfully looks from the outside as as disorganization or chaos, but but it is an inevitable step in the process. And now I think we are coming out the other side of that toward starting to coalesce around something that is a coherent alternative. Um, and and that's exactly the the premise of rebuilding American capitalism is you know not to say it is the final definitive word on it or that it is even comprehensive, 
Um, but that I think it does a pretty good job of of reflecting if if you if you take all that thinking, it provides a foundation and a diagnosis of what is wrong and 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 how we need to change how we think about it. And then it starts to give you that agenda that that you would want to have in focus. And now we're at this point where either that will win or it it will lose. I mean, I think the 2024 primaries, you know, as long as Trump himself is front and center within the party, you will have that chaos to some extent. So I don't know that the 2024 primary is necessary necessarily the that that key inflection point, but it's certainly one where you will see, okay, who chooses to pick up which pieces of what, what's most successful. Um, and then I think we are over the next four or five years in that stage where it is time to ask what is actually going to emerge. So you framed the collection around a couple of core sections, and the first one is responsive politics. What does responsive politics mean? Why do you hate the word populism? <laughs> what, 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 what exactly are you trying to do here? <laughs> I have to admit, I've come to hate the word populism less. Um, the reason I always hated the word populism is because it just struck me as like a sort of word for looking down your nose at actually doing things that voters want you to do. And so it always seemed to me like, well, Barack Obama was a populist, wasn't he? But we're just not supposed to call him that because the left likes it. Like it, it, wasn't, it wasn't clear to me how we were drawing these lines. Because he used fancy words. <laughs> yeah, I think the, you know, the 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 better definition that I I do find more useful is that it it is based in a theory that those with power are using it badly in a, in a sense if yeah. I were to sort of summarize and so so in that respect I, I I guess I would be something of a populist um but the responsive politics then speaks to something different which is much more the like maybe we should actually listen to what what people want us to do um in a way that that neither political party I, I think has been getting right and and is exactly that first piece I was describing you know after 2016 which is why it's first in the book also which is okay, if we actually stop to notice that notwithstanding our statistics, people are not happy with the direction the country is going, um, that that's an incredibly powerful first step that bizarrely most political leaders don't seem to think they're supposed to do. And especially <laughs> and, and especially on the right of center, though, and, and I think this kind of fits into this core libertarian versus conservative critique libertarians sort of reject the premise of doing. I, I think of the libertarian model is basically like, well, as long as we have free choice and everyone can optimize their own life accordingly, everyone is living their own best life. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we don't really have to look beyond that. Live, if, laugh, love. <laughs> yeah, well, and like, hey, if people aren't forming families or having kids, that must be because they found something else that's more fun. Mm -hmm. And like, why look into it any further than that? And so for us, you know, responsive politics is is a core element of conservative economics and, and an acknowledgement that what we are doing here is political economy. It is not this sort of um, blackboard model of how to optimize everyone's consumption choices. It is how to make the economy work for the American people. And therefore, to do that, you have to actually be interested in um, what the American people want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we broke it into to two pieces, the American condition and the American ambition that really just summarizes a lot of our research first on sort of what has gone wrong, even though, you know, the top line GDP numbers, even though consumption might look good. What are those things underneath that, whether it is in terms of actual wages, family formation, educational outcomes, um, you know, ultimately, then you get into things like, you know, China shock, deaths of despair, um, that are motivating the dissatisfaction rightly and that do do need to be the focus of policymaking. And then along with that, what is the American ambition? How, you know, you, you hear like, oh, like the American dream. I'm always struck by the extent to which, especially on the right of center, the American dream is defined for the most part as like earning more money than your father did. So I'm like, like, is that the American dream? I like, let's let's go and test that a little bit. And what you find, again, mostly just from surveying people and asking them what they care about, and we try to always ask questions that sort of pose trade-offs, because it's very easy to survey, like, how many of these things do you like? Yeah. Like, motherhood, yes. Apple pie, yes. Right? It's like, oh, well, as you can puppies see, they like, they, like <laughs> they like motherhood, apple pie, and puppies. It's like, well, <laughs> I, like, thank you for that survey data. 
But it's a lot more interesting to ask, for instance, um, you know, in, in, in the educational context, are you looking, you know, to the extent that there's a choice between these, is public education's role to equip people with the skills and values to build decent lives in their communities? Or is it to maximize their academic achievement and make sure they can get into the best possible college? And obviously, we have been operating our education system in pursuit of the second. Mm -hmm. And yet people, regardless of economic class, regardless of political party, will choose the first by like three or four to one. I mean, and and you can find the exact set of like double, you know, double income professional college or you know post-college educated folks who will choose the second category mm -hmm. and they are our nation's policymakers. <laughs> um, but it's important to understand that that is not what most people actually see as the goal or aspiration. You see the same thing in the family context where, um, you know, every every year you know, we get both parties celebrating this, like, look at how we've like pushed women's labor force participation to a new high. And like everyone stands up and applaud. This was the one line in a Trump state of the union that the Democrats all stood up and applauded for. And you know, if if that's what women are aspiring to do, then that would be an important sign of success. The problem is when you ask people, particularly when they are raising young children, how they would like to organize their lives, there's a, a substantial, overwhelming preference for having a parent at home with young kids. Um, typically, empirically, however you survey it, women and men will both typically say, um, they, they would like to have the mother at home with the young kids. And in fact, the group that feels that way most strongly is married mothers. So um, you can be for choice, which, which we should be, and saying that we want to have an economy and a society where people can order their lives as they want, but also recognize that, in fact, what most people want is not something they feel they're able to achieve right now. And the libertarian view that like, well, they have their choices and whatever they're choosing must be what they want, completely fails to recognize the way that the policies we choose and then the economy we have influences what their choices actually are. And so something that we frame as just incredibly important is this idea of a single income being so sufficient to raise a family. Mm -hmm. And and it's so important to recognize that that doesn't mean that you should have a single worker doing the work to raise the family, yeah. but it means that the income should be sufficient because if that's true, then you truly do have the choice of how you organize your life. If it's not true, then the way you're organizing your life should not be seen as a reflection of, of what you actually aspire to. Yeah. There's so many constituent pieces of, of making that kind of economy happen, and, and you guys dive into many of them. Uh, but one maybe caveat to it is, you know, the, the the left and the right both will accuse that vision of sort of being a, a reactionary impulse from the 1950s, and and we don't live in that America anymore. And and on some level, I sometimes wonder if they're they're right. You know, technological advancement um, makes that the case. You know, especially when it comes to kids any older than two or three years old. Um, you know, they're at school, and you know, fathers at work, or you know, whichever parent. Like, it, what do you say to the people who say that it's anachronistic to to aim for that kind of economy? Well, first of all, I say it's not it's not my personal preference yeah. that I am promoting. It is what people who live yeah, in America yeah. want. So um, if people look at that way of organizing their lives and see a lot to recommend it, that's that's fine with me. Um, the what in theory could be a, a better critique, but strikes me as ludicrous is that point you made that like, well, you know, because of the way things have changed, like that's not a reasonable expectation anymore. And and that's the one that just kind of blows my mind and, and was really you know, when I wrote the Once in Future Worker, gosh, going on five years ago now. Right. There it is right in the pile. <laughs> um, that's that's the official mandatory book plug. That was really like. It was, I think it was in the introduction or whatever, but I feel like the whole book pivoted on this exact point, which is like, if we've had these decades of what we claim is economic growth and technological progress and all these things that we say are so great and successful, and yet things that were possible and people that they say, people say is core to what they want before all of that is no longer possible today, then what we had in between is not progress. 
And so I would agree as a descriptive matter that when people say, well, a lot of things have changed and it's you can't just do that the way you used to be able to. Yes, <laughs> that that is exactly the problem. But yeah. there is no law of nature or economics that says that 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 has to be the case. Yeah. In fact, to the contrary, in any well-functioning economic system, as technological progress and prosperity expand, it should become easier. Yeah. And so that that is exactly that is the question at the heart of all of this is what has gone so wrong in the economy and what has gone so wrong with a right of center that looks at it and says, A, we must start from a position of defending this as success and B, our point of view on it is that because it is what happened, it is success. Yeah. It's just a bunch of public policymakers standing around a lever that's in the wrong position being like, golly gee, it's so unfortunate that that lever is in that direction. <laughs> well, and it's it's like it's 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 not even just that that it's like a lever that's in the wrong direction because like we are going in the wrong direction, mm -hmm. right? Like I almost think of it as like it's like a car that is like, you know, driven off into the woods and crashed into a tree and the policymakers have all gotten around and they're standing around their heads like, you know, standing around scratching their heads saying like, is this Chesterton's fence? Was this car always meant to be right, here? Like, well, right, like, like, well, I guess, yeah, Hayek, you know, how do I apply Hayek to this situation and conclude that, you know, truly um, this was the only way the car could have driven. And it's like, I don't know. What about if we'd stayed on the road? Like, like can I can I get any votes for that? Yeah. So, OK, let's dive into the, the brass tacks here. The first section uh, after responsive politics is globalization. What is the assessment of the global economy? Um, I read on the news all the time that the world is deglobalizing, that you know, great power competitions back. I mean, again, this is a place where I think it's valuable to take the conversation and the status quo as what it is today, as opposed to what it was seven years ago when this conversation started. We had COVID, we've had supply chain crises, we've had geostrategic competition. What's the lay of the land and what must be done? Well, I think for for globalization, and, and I would step back slightly, the, the, the way that we organize it is, as you said, we start with responsive politics. And then when you get into policy, there are these sort of two big headings. There's productive markets, and supportive communities. And so the, the productive markets is kind of like the big macro top down, how does our economy work side of it. And as you said, the, the first piece in there is globalization. Um, and, and and the way that we try to, to talk about this and, and encourage conservatives to think about it, and, and it's right there implicit in the term productive markets, is that like not all free markets are equal. <laughs> You, you can have free markets that are working really well and are productive, and you can have free markets that are really not working well. The Cayman Islands is a truly prosperous place. <clears throat> the Cayman Don't Island, ask any I, questions. <laughs> it's, it is the freest of markets. You can do whatever the hell you want. Um, and so the idea of productive markets and, and ultimately rebuilding American capitalism is to say, if you want capitalism to work well, you have to have this set of conditions in place that that actually aligns the pursuit of profit with the common good. That's that's Adam Smith's whole insight. It's not, hey, the Cayman Islands is going to be super prosperous because <laughs> there's like this weird and you know disembodied invisible hand flying around. It's that if you have a situation where the things that people do to pursue profit are also ones that serve the public interest, mm -hmm. then as if by an invisible hand, people serving their self-interest will also serve the public good. It's, it's actually almost a tautology, um, but but a useful one to recognize and because it, it should focus policymakers on this exact point. This is our goal. How do we make sure that uh, the things that are going to generate the most profit in the private sector where we want the economic activity happening are also ones that generate the common good? And so globalization is, is, uh, is the quintessential illustration of this because if you think about what globalization does – when it says, hey, American business leaders, uh, investors, you could use your capital and acumen to build a business here in America that creates good jobs for American workers. But let us tell you about this opportunity to create even more profit, shutting that business down and moving it to China. It's like, then you'll generate even more profit. And by the weird uh, it's not even really fair to call it libertarian. This is where sort of market fundamentalism, I think, is the right concept. This weird market fundamentalism dictates that, like, well, because that's free to move your <laughs> to move your factory wherever you want, 
and it creates more profit, that must surely therefore accrue to the common good. And it's like, nope, not what Adam Smith said, not what any rational person would ever believe. And and what's going on there, the problem with, with globalization is that it it breaks down that relationship between capital and labor. That that for capitalism to work well, what you actually have to have, have happening, the secret sauce is that the way to make the most profit possible is to use the workers you have with you productively. And when that actually happens, we, we sort of see it as a, a mutual dependence, it, it can indeed accrue to everybody's benefit. When you when you sever that and you say, um, actually, I mean, the workers don't have anywhere to go. I guess they, well, they can't, but even if they could move to China and work as, you know, Chinese serfs, I'm not sure that would be to their benefit. Uh, but capital, by all means, go find other workers. You're, it's really the antithesis of capitalism. It's mm-hmm. not the highest form. And so I think to your point, you know, people are are starting to see the the failure of globalization from from all of these different perspectives. One is from this economic perspective, post China shock and so forth, and just with with the economic trajectory generally, uh, that there's no reason to believe that globalization and free trade, especially when your partners are the Chinese Communist Party, um, is is actually going to benefit you or your market or help capitalism work. And then along with that, you're seeing the breakdown of the sort of post-Cold War uniparty blob consensus that like by virtue of globalizing, we will bring all the world's countries together in the harmony of liberal democracy. And it's like, I guess, hypothetically, (laughs) let's say that by letting China into the WTO, they were going to become a liberal democracy. And like, would free trade have worked? It would still have had a lot of problems and would have need to be managed more effectively than it was. But you could envision a world in which it was a partnership that was valuable and beneficial to both sides. But it also was never sold as that to going back to responsive politics. You know, it's when when we do free trade agreements, it's not sold to the American voter as this is going to make the Koreans more democratic. It's sold as somehow somehow magic magic this is going to make you richer and it's never the case well uh, so that is certain i think that's correct that politicians lead with this is going to create more great american jobs um because of that is rightly what the american voter is most concerned about it is very interesting to go back to that sort of 1999 to 2001 and you know holiday from history era um and see, you know, Bill Clinton and George W. Bush basically outbidding each other to to make this comprehensive case because I, because you know it's pretty hard in even a quite high level political debate to maintain this case that this is going to be great and good for American workers if you believe that China is going to remain you know an authoritarian communist country, and so it is actually quite prominent in the rhetoric. Um, and was part of the sort of aspirational democracy promotion, nation building kind of spirit of the age um, that a key reason for this policy and reason why we should have confidence in it was because uh, it, it was going to create an America like China. Bill Clinton has this incredible line like I see, you know, people say China is going to try to like block the Internet. Good luck. It's, it's like, yeah, actually, <laughs> turns out. Turns out they can they can do that. Um, so so that's you know and and the interesting thing about the this globalization topic generally is that it it also for instance applies to immigration. I mean if you think about immigration in the economic context, it it is part and parcel of globalization. It is right. yet another way to say like, well, what if we didn't tell corporations they needed to be successful and earn profit with the workers who are here? They can simply demand other workers that will provide even higher profits. Um, and so the whole globalization section is focused around this idea of, of what we call the bounded market, which is that if you want free market capitalism to work, and we think you should want it to work, then borders actually really matter. And holding together American producers and workers um, in that mutual dependence is part of what you need for capitalism to work. The fact that we released it is a huge part 
of the reason we've gotten all of these these undesirable outcomes in markets. Um, but the good news it is, is it is actually, to your point about the lever, something within policymakers' control, that if we want capitalism to work, we, we can bring that back in. So one of the levers to undo the consequential effects of globalization is uh, the the scary term de jour in Washington, uh, industrial policy. There, there is a section labeled industry in uh, rebuilding American capitalism. What is that all about? Well, in in one respect, it, it follows directly from the globalization point, which is uh, if part of the plan here is to say, like, actually, you have to make a lot of things here in America with American workers, um, we should probably make sure that's that's doable. Yeah, it's not like <laughs> saying that's not just a magic wand. Right. It's like the, a, that, that's right. The there shall be. <laughs> we, we're not going to we don't uh, now. It will provide part of it yeah. if if you do have to serve American consumers from within America, that right there is a pretty darn strong incentive to go make that type of investment. Um, but at the same time, something that I think, you know, as a complement to it, that's important to recognize is that, again, going back to what Adam Smith actually meant and how capitalism actually works, you know, investors are going to channel their investment toward whatever has the highest return on capital. So if you want capitalism to work, the things that have the highest return on capital have to also be things that that are of social value. And one of the problems in the modern economy um, is that an awful lot of the things that appear to have the highest return on capital, to have the, you know, to to require the least capital to begin with, to have the lowest risk, to have the low, you know, the shortest timelines, tend to be things in the digital economy, tend to be things in financial markets. Um, tend not to be, let's build the next Tesla, right? I mean, one of the remarkable things about Elon Musk, um, in part because he was not especially accountable to capital markets in how he was operating, is that his success in building a Tesla or a SpaceX is like such a bizarre outlier. Um, It's actually interesting, what everyone thinks of Amazon today, Jeff Bezos was so successful and was such an outlier in part because he simply refused to acknowledge or pay attention to Wall Street. I mean, there are years and years and years of articles in in business publications saying, what the hell is this guy doing? He just keeps plowing back every dollar back into building the company, expanding the footprint. Um, because at the Amazon business, it's not really a tech company at all. It's an incredibly you know massive physical footprint, capital intensive business. And and is the most complicated machine, small m, in the entire world. That's uh, very well put. And so now on the one hand, you can look at Bezos and Musk and say, hey, guys, like, guess who are the richest people in the world now? Like, <laughs> <laughs> so in the long run, there actually is a lot of economic logic behind building things. Yeah. The The problem is that the from the outlook of the, uh, of the investor up front, um, or if you're just some passive person with a lot of capital who wants a return on it... Um, those look like very risky bets, and they are very risky bets. And so at the end of the day, the premise of industrial policy for all the fights and debates about it is an acknowledgement that the things that capital is naturally flowing to in our economy are not the highest value um, for the good of workers, the society, the nation, the long-term trajectory of economic growth. Because there's no reason to believe they should. No. <laughs> should be. There's not, there's nothing in economic theory that says that that those two would be aligned. And so industrial policy is a set of tools to try to bring those into alignment, to yeah. try to make the kinds of investments that we think would be most valuable to America's economic future, the kinds of things that are also actually going to be really attractive to the investors and the business leaders. We talked about this when we had Julius Krein on. And more and more, I think it's it's the most useful framework to see why we don't have manufacturing in the United States is that your marginal investment dollar coming out of Wall Street simply sees much greater returns uh, in funny money SaaS companies than they ever will in hard tech and manufacturing. And reorienting those priorities is good in and of itself, probably. Um, and then for national security reasons would be hugely important. And then also in terms of the downstream effects it would have on providing a productive uh, labor market for, for all Americans. Um, part of that rebalancing of the scales is uh, looking critically at Wall Street itself. 
uh, what is the situation with financialization in the United States and what uh, does American Compass propose in doing about it? So financialization for us is is exactly the, the sort of flip side of this industrial policy coin, which is, you know, we can tell you all about the things that that are more economically valuable, that, that need more investment in terms of what is happening instead that is not economically valuable. One piece of it is the over-reliance on tech and SaaS and apps and this kind of stuff. Um, but I think the the bigger problem is probably that if you just look at how financial markets are operating, um, they, you know, financial markets decide where the capital flows to um, or, or whether it flows at all. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we at American Compass are robustly pro-financial market. Mm -hmm. In theory, <laughs> but right, I mean, it's not like this Occupy Wall Street, like like boo investment banks or whatever, right? Like actual investment banks. If if you were an actual investment bank and you actually gathered the capital of investors and deployed it in the economy, building productive things, that would be awesome. And you deserve to be paid a, a good, good, good profit for doing that. If you're good at it. Well, right, if you, you deserve a piece of, of the profit that that activity generates. As coin flip capital taught us, one of your other collections, it's not entirely clear that they are good at it. This is, well, that's right. And so, so this is the problem is that, again, if you think about like, okay, what are the best ways to make a lot of money in the American economy? Um, doing that thing that an investment bank should actually do isn't necessarily it or is, is rarely it. And partly that's because downstream – the kind of investments you're making probably aren't going to be those really valuable, productive ones. But the other part is that upstream, as that operator in the financial market, at this point, you're probably not actually investing in anything at all. And and this is something that that I love to harp on is just what we mean by the word invest, right? Like we say, like, if I go out and buy some, you know, stock in Google, we will say I, quote, invested in Google, right? But that's not true. Google doesn't get that money from me and use it to build some great new service. The other guy who owned Google stock gets that money from me. Yeah. Google is not even aware that the transaction took place. And most of what we call investing today is not actually moving capital into operating companies mm -hmm. where they deploy it to create productive things in the real world. Mm -hmm. It's just moving piles of assets around in circles, right? It's OK, well, we took all of our money and gave it to BlackRock, who then pulled all of that together and put it into an ETF, which bought, you know, little pieces of every company in the economy from other people who already held those shares, who took that money and maybe then turned around and <laughs> bought the ETFs or, to, you know, put into Bitcoin mm -hmm. or let's let's keep in mind, like they don't have to put in anything. They can go buy a boat. Yeah. And even like a 0.1% optimism on the potential of that price to rise in each of those stages gets you your 4% economic growth or whatever. Well, so I mean, from the perspective of each of the actors in that chain, it's really important to note, you know, essentially operating as middlemen, it's, uh, we, we should really call it the office space economy, right? Because it's all of these people like, well, if we all just take a fraction of a cent, yeah. no one will notice <laughs> and we'll all end up with billions of dollars. Yeah. And to your point about you know coin flip capitalism, one thing we looked at a lot is like private equity and hedge funds, which are these are the top places that our top business schools send our top business talent to. They pay the highest salaries. Like wow, they must be doing something like super important and valuable. And then you look at it, and what you discover is even if you just wanted to assess it in purely economic terms, like they're not even good at it in a lot of cases. I mean, hedge funds wildly underperform any index you might want to compare them to. There's a small set of private equity funds that does tend to do quite well. But by and large, a lot of private equity firms are disastrous and and quite now not in absolute terms. They make money, but they don't make more money than just putting your money in an index fund would have. And especially fun is that if you actually try to look for correlations and say like, OK, well, you know, your fund from 2005 to 2010 was a top performing fund. How did your 2010 to 2015 fund do? There tends to be virtually no correlation. Yeah. It's much better understood as a bunch of people flipping a coin and the ones who come up heads think they're really good at flipping heads. Um, and then we pay everybody, by the way, regardless of, <laughs> of which way the coin came up. Um, and so that's that's just not good. And And one thing that we see as a result is that one of the ways that this is able to operate and continue to generate money for everybody involved 
even though it is not creating value in the real economy, is that it, it has actually become highly extractive. And what I mean by that is, as I said, if you're actually making productive investment in the economy, you deserve some piece of the profit from that investment. Otherwise, you wouldn't make it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So over time, we should expect to see corporations actually giving money, more money back to capital markets than capital markets are putting into them. Otherwise, why would anyone ever put any money into a company? Mm -hmm. But what we see in recent years is a sharp uptick in that. The amount of money that corporations are returning to investors in the financial markets keeps going up, even as actual productive investment keeps going down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we are in a long-term secular decline in actual business investment as a share of GDP and a long-term increase in return to shareholders mm -hmm. as a percent of GDP. And that is really unhealthy. And again, explains why everybody is going and doing that in the capital markets, explains why our economy isn't performing very well and, and <laughs> cries out for policymakers to say, there is nothing inherently um, good or logical about that arrangement. That is a sign of a malfunction in capitalism and a place where policy actually needs to step in and, first of all, try to disfavor some of these things we should be willing to say are just not useful and try to shift incentives to encourage the kinds of behaviors that are actually the key to capitalism working. So these are the three macro things that need to be done in order to make American capitalism function the way it should. Um, but one of the primary orienting um, values that American Compass brings to the conversation is that who are these markets for? And and you guys make the contention that they are for families, communities. Um, so let's go into some of the supportive communities element of, of the collection rebuilding American capitalism. Uh, family. Um, family policy is another one of these shibboleths I hear around town all the time. Uh, what, what exactly should we do? Is this the child tax credit? Is that what this is about? <laughs> it's an even bigger, better child tax credit. Um, no, I mean, look, the starting point for this is is actually to recognize a, a key conservative insight that in, in recent decades has just gotten like run into the brick wall of libertarian control of economic policy, which is conservatives rightly harp on the incredible importance of family as the environment in which young people are raised and formed and prepared to be become productive citizens. And we rightly obsess about the importance of having two parents, about you know, having role models, being in a stable community, all of these things. And yet, when we get to the economic context, we turn around and just say, well, anyone who works hard can succeed in America. And it's like, well, if that's true, then why do you care about family? It's like, oh, we really care about family because we know that that's the key to people being on a path to success. And it's like, but I thought anybody could succeed in America. <laughs> and and that's not to to say, you know, that it, it's not true that people who work hard can succeed in America. We, we should absolutely celebrate and, and hold that up as an ideal and as something that it is in many cases true. But we should not lose sight of, of the core conservative insight that the set of institutions that forms people and prepares them for life in the community, in the economy, is absolutely vital both to their own personal success and outcomes and uh, how that market is then going to function, right? One of my favorite things about all the recent labor shortage debates is that you have this business community that has steadfastly refused to take seriously or care at all about the actual health of Americans, families, or communities um, and basically promoted this economic model that, that rapidly erodes these things. Um, and leaves people unprepared to enter the workforce and take jobs. And then they turn around and scream, we can't find any workers. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you can't. But that that's not in your economic model, apparently. Um, so in general, supportive communities, uh, is it, it it is at that micro level. It feels very different than talking about financialization. But it's equally important to making American capitalism work. And it is equally something that America has gotten wrong and, and that the right of center deserves a huge part of the blame for. Um, and so the, the family piece at the heart of that goes to, to this recognition, and we talked about this in the responsive politics context, that it has become a lot harder to support a family, particularly on one income. Um, we have made it economically difficult to 
and and less attractive to form a family, to have and raise kids, to provide them with a stable environment. Uh, and we see it happening a lot less. And in the long run, I would love to be in a place where the economy is just generating those great jobs and everyone, you know, anyone who finds a job can support their family and we don't have to think about it anymore. In, in any sort of short to medium term, and especially as we think about bootstrapping this system that 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 has fallen so far, actually providing some of that support to working families to acknowledge the gap that we have allowed to open up, I think is incredibly important. And so um, what we proposed is, in a sense, it's a big expansion of the child tax credit, but it importantly rejects the idea that it is a tax credit. Mm -hmm. um, Not everything has to be tax policy. Ideally, very few things would be tax <laughs> policy. And so we call it the, the family income supplemental credit. It is still a credit. Um, but we, <laughs> you would need it to see at the end of the acronym. Yeah. What can I do? Yeah. Um, the FISC, which which we see as a very social security like program, yeah. is a program of social insurance that recognizes that just the biological reality, just as like when you get old, you can't keep working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a biological reality for which public policy might want to to pr provide a role. Um, families have a real problem that you you simultaneously see a decrease in your earning capacity and an increase in your expenses at a moment early in life when you can't possibly have saved for it. Now, again, in an ideal world, you would have the support of extended family. You would have better paying um, full-time jobs for one workers, et cetera. Obviously, this has worked. This works for plenty of people today, but it has gotten a lot harder. And so providing support to families who are working, not as just a universal welfare program, um, that basically on a per child basis, especially for young children, um, tries to fill that gap that has opened up in recent decades, uh, I think would be just an incredibly important thing to do. So what we've proposed is, you know, it's on the order of $400 a month for, for young children, $250 a month for older children. So for a family with two or three kids, even with relatively low income, um, they could be receiving ten or fifteen thousand dollars a year. That that fully makes up for the stagnant wages and shift in income away from the middle class in recent decades, and is for a, for a large number of families going to be the difference between having both parents have to work and being able to make your own decision about how you want to organize family life. And so, you know, some people promote these things as like that's going to create an incentive for people to have more kids. The evidence on that is mixed. At the margin, presumably it does. I don't think you're going to turn that around through just giving people money. For me, I think it's much more important to understand it as that's going to make it easier for people to raise families. And if one consequence of that is that people look around and see and say, hey, that looks like something I want to do too, then that's great. But I'm most interested in helping the families that are and and making it easier for them to succeed and making it easier for them to raise that next generation. And this is fertile ground because ha, every good pun <laughs> uh, is, is because when you poll people going back to responsive politics, um, most people in America want to have more kids than they have. And so by making it more economically available to do so, you, you will probably create an environment where that discrepancy can be. Can yeah, be bridged. That, that's exactly right. Just to add one point on this. So we, we did a bunch of surveying on this. And it's really interesting to see that, you know, roughly half of people say they have the number of kids they want to have. And then half say they have fewer than they want to have. What you'd call undershooting, whereas virtually no one is overshooting. Um, and so you have a, a clear skew there. We then asked a follow up question to everybody who reported undershooting saying, you know, what, what did you see as the primary obstacle? And for the, the lower and working and middle classes, basically, you know, no college degree, less than six figure incomes, roughly speaking, uh, overwhelmingly the top response was affordability concerns. For, for upper class couples, dual college, uh, college degree, both working, high income, they are equally likely to say they had fewer kids than they want, but they will respond it was conflict with career or lifestyle. And so... To me, that speaks to exactly this weird impulse of some right of center commentators and, and analysts who will say, well, look, this is just a choice people are making. Mm -hmm. Because in their milieu, that's exactly right. 
This is just a choice people are making. And if they're complaining about it, um, it, it is in fact a trade-off and they could have made another one. For everybody else in America, <laughs> ultimately, is it a choice? Could they scrape by? Obviously, there are lots of people who have lots of kids. Um, in some senses, it is a choice, but it is a real function of economic constraint that they are are feeling unable to make the choice they want. There are three major cost centers, I think, that are causing it to be more uh, unaffordable to have and raise a family, uh, healthcare, education, um, and uh Housing. Housing, that's right. Um, let's talk about education. Um, it has cultural implications that might lead to that higher income discrepancy in infertility that you talked about. It has certainly economic implications. It has workforce development implications. Well, what's American Compass's answer to the question of education? Well, so on, on education, and, and it's the second of these supportive community buckets, you know, our view is, and this goes back to, again, the responsive politics context, we're just trying to do the wrong thing. Um, we have pursued this college for all model that's very consistent with our economic thinking generally. We're going to create, you know, we're, we're going to push people as far as they can go. These winners are going to be highly productive. They're going to create a lot of wealth and somehow we're all going to benefit. Um, but it is a total failure for the the majority of Americans. And you know, my favorite analysis on this point is just to walk through the different steps in the pipeline. And and from one perspective, our system looks OK. Most people graduate from high school. Most people who graduate from high school go to college. Most people who go to college complete college. Most people who complete college end up in a job that requires a degree. Right. What I just said sounds like a fairly successful system. The problem is if you look in the negative space at the people you lose at each of those steps, by the end, you've lost almost everybody. So you actually have fewer than one in five who actually go high school to college to career. Everybody else is is dropping out somewhere along the way. And so you have the vast majority of the population for whom the system that we've set up, high schools basically as college prep academies, get you into a college, massively subsidize that experience, though potentially saddling you with a lot of debt, try to create the kinds of jobs that are going to be great jobs for people with college degrees. Um, we are just leaving most people behind with that. Yeah. And so, and by the way, to your point about the the economic cost, this idea that you'd better, you know, if you have a kid, that also means being prepared to support them for four years at, you know, the amusement park entitlement of a college campus. Um, that's obviously a huge and totally unnecessary financial pressure given what you're actually getting for it. And so, you know, our view is that we need to just aggressively de-emphasize college in the culture, in the economy, um, and instead say, look, there are people for whom college is the right pathway. If you want to be a public policy wonk, you know, if you're, you're doing well in school, your idea of a good time is like doing some more reading and discussing things in a classroom, that's great. We should still have support for people who want to do that, but we need to stop privileging it over everything else. Um, even most things that we think of as sort of college jobs today, you know, whether you're nursing, accounting, et cetera, et cetera, go, go to a college campus for four years isn't the right way to prepare for that. Uh, and by the way, a lot of people, maybe a college campus and that kind of education would be great for them someday, but not at age 18. And so creating a much wider range of, of non-college pathways that connect people to the workforce much sooner that build in the in in the skill development as on the job, partly because being on the job helps a hell of a lot, partly because it means they can be paid instead of paying, and partly because it means there's an actual employer who knows what skills are needed, who's directing the process, um, is, is just a much, much better way to do it. And I think if we did that, you would see a, a, a bunch of benefits. One, as you mentioned, is just in the affordability context, you would take a huge financial burden off both the, the the plate of parents who are thinking about affording for their kids and also young people who are trying to come through this system that mostly doesn't work for them, um, you would create a much better and more skilled workforce that is prepared for the kinds of, of jobs that we actually need people to be productive in. Um, and you would also start to shift some of those incentives for businesses. I mean, one of the, you know, uh, I like complaining about the way businesses talk about skills gaps, because at the end of the day, it's the business's job to 
build a business that works with the workers available to them. Um, but I am sympathetic to the point that if you are trying to, you know, run a construction firm, run a manufacturing firm, run run a hospital for that matter, um, you're looking around and you're like, well, what am like? Who is preparing anybody for this kind of work? I'm just supposed to do it all myself. Whereas if you're like a think tank, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, thank you for this like large flow of people who the public has chosen to spend years and years aggressively investing in the preparation of. Um, so I think pre preparing people for more productive and, and wide range of fields would mm -hmm. also lead to better incentives to build the kinds of jobs that imply, you know, employs those people productively. Our, our education system is industrial policy for white collar labor, and mayhaps we we should have some of that for blue collar labor it, as well. It, it is, and and especially for healthcare. This mm. is this is a point that um that that I love to make when people say like, oh, we shouldn't have industrial policies. We have industrial policies. Yeah. It's just for who we have, <laughs> and, and I just mentioned we don't actually support hospitals well at all. Yeah. But if you look at the amount of public resources we put into preparing people to be be doctors. Um, go work at pharma companies and develop drugs. <laughs> and then the amount of subsidy we provide to the consumption of those things, like surprise, guess what a massive <laughs> sector of the economy is that's, you know, grown fast. Healthcare. We, we essentially have industrial policy for hedge funds. Mm. Look at, look at how intensively we prepare people to go work at hedge funds. Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice if we shifted that a little bit. Absolutely. And, and if we did, uh, there would be a need for workers to be able to organize accordingly. The final element of the supportive community section of rebuilding American capitalism is labor policy. Now, we actually just did uh, a long episode with Jonathan Berry about his chapter for the Heritage Foundation's book on these matters. Um, but, but but what did he write for you guys? Uh, is it more based in red pilled? Like what's going on? <laughs> it, it may. I think he's probably. It was probably more based. What he wrote for us was probably more based in red pilled than what he could put in the heritage chapter. Yeah. Um, John, Jonathan's the best. Read hi, highly recommend reading anything. We are he, Jonathan Berry enjoyers here. Yes, <laughs> anything he writes for anyone. Um, labor is such an interesting issue for conservatives because, again, from the libertarian point of view we're supposed to despise it and cheer its demise. Like, you know, union busting is like, let's be honest, a core, <laughs> core right of center value in some, in some spaces. And to be clear, you know, big labor as it operates today is, is highly dysfunctional. We, we are not supporters of the pro act or, you know, looking like, how do we just, you know, like, let's just get everybody to check off a card saying they want to be in a union. This is, Part of the problem is that because big labor has become an extension of the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party's labor policy is just how do we get more workers into this specific set of unions that gives us money yeah. without respect to what workers want. And then as a result, the Republican policy is, well, how do we stop workers yeah. <laughs> from going to these? It's 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 totally counterproductive. And so I think we are probably second to no one in, in saying we need to, to stop that system. I mean, one very... Pro straightforward proposal in rebuilding American capitalism is just prohibit unions from spending on politics. Like th this shouldn't be that hard. It's, I mean, American Compass is a 501c3. We are obviously allowed to advocate for our ideas, but we can't go give money to political campaigns. Uh, the same should be true of a labor union. And if a labor union wants to set up a PAC and encourage people to donate to it, that's fine. But that's not the actual core task of the labor union. Um, so if you step back, though, and say, like, OK, but what is labor? Like, what is the idea of a labor movement of organizing? It's really one of the most deeply conservative ideas out there, I would argue. And and I don't say this as like one of these pedantic like, oh, like the conservative case for yeah. insert this highly progressive thing. <laughs> um, what what I mean is that the the actual conceptual premise here is that we should want workers to be able to come together and advance their own interests. Mm -hmm. Um, ideally without the mediator of government between them. Ideally without the mediator of government between them. And and whether that means in the labor market, we should want to have workers to have comparable power to employers so that they can actually demand good wages. And, and you know, ideally it's not uh, how do we just redistribute to them after the fact because wages are too low. Um, that should be our preference. 
in the workplace, we should want workers to have representation in part because we don't like tyranny. <laughs> and um, we should recognize that workers have interests that the market is not just going to protect in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And from a regulatory perspective, we should want workers on a on a level playing field with employers to be able to work out how the workplace is going to be governed. Because again, the alternative is not some hypothetical Cayman Islands free market. It is government regulation. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, and, and this goes to that supportive communities point in particular, you know, labor and, and worker organizations are an incredibly powerful source of social capital um, and solidarity. And, you know, not by coincidence is is labor a core tenet of Catholic social teaching and a recognition that if, if you believe in subsidiarity, if you believe in strong communities, if you believe in people doing things together and for each other, um, then having a way to bring workers together to do exactly that should obviously be a priority. And the great news is it is something that policy can support. Because to your point, we don't want government stepping in and doing things instead of workers. Um, but the structure of public policy has a huge influence on, on the ability of workers to organize. And so the policies in, in this section of, of the handbook really focus on this idea of, okay, how do we, what do we need to disrupt in what's broken in the existing system? Um, but then rather than just cheering and saying, that's awesome. Now everyone can drive for Uber and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have a wonderful world. Um, what sorts of structures would actually support healthy labor organizing, encourage workers to come together, to exert power, um, and and even to be a site for those government programs that do exist? And one, one really interesting thing that exists in some European countries is what's called the Ghent system, where, for instance, you get your unemployment benefits typically from a union. Um, unions play a lead role in training. We have some isolated places like in the building trades where that does happen in the U.S. And that's great. We should be leaning in as hard as we can on making that happen more. And that is, again, kind of <laughs> coming back to where we started, that would build more supportive communities. But it's, it is also just a fundamental ingredient of capitalism working well. The Adam Smith, if you actually read it, very concerned about worker power and supportive of the idea of, of workers being able to exert more power. John Stuart Mill, the original libertarian, big fan of organized labor, because they recognize that if you actually want a free market and capitalism and a well-functioning society, you can't just abandon workers to be atomized individuals. You have to be in concerned about their interests and want them to be able to, to come together and defend them. Oren, all of this has been extremely interesting, but we've only gotten a chance to cover uh, the surface of each of these issues. Where can people find this this fantastic tome, Rebuilding <laughs> American Capitalism? Uh, at AmericanCompass.org. I'm sure it will be plastered broadly across our homepage and every other page. Um, it's it's a whole book, um, but we've, we've sort of created a custom site to make it readable in, in online form. There's a, a lot of the sort of broader discussion about the themes. There's tons of policy proposals in each area. We're also really excited that we, this is a sort of an initial effort to bring together the broader community of um, of conservative scholars who are working on this stuff. So there are a couple dozen experts across all of these areas who have each written their own commentaries. Um, really, as we frame them as memoranda to policymakers, if you know, here's how you should be thinking about labor, how you should be thinking about globalization, uh, which I think adds a lot of richness to the product as well. So we're very hopeful that it will it will provide that foundation for work to go going forward, um, and that it will be a just a really valuable resource for um, for policymakers who are are trying to head in this direction. And just to clarify, what what are the things that policymakers should come to American Compass for, or Hill staff, or anyone else who might be listening to this podcast? It's been a little while since we've had you give the full spiel for for Compass itself. <laughs> well, this 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 discussion has been a fairly good spiel for yeah. Compass itself. Yeah. If, if you've made it this far in the discussion, <laughs> you've you've heard a lot of the stuff we're working yeah. on. Um, I mean, beyond this, you know, we also do a lot of work on on tech policy. Um, we've just put out a, a major paper on China and the idea that the sort of strategic decoupling, de-risking kind of rhetoric is is totally inadequate to the challenge and we need to to really affect a hard break. Um, you know, at the end of the day, our mission is 
is to restore an economic consensus that that emphasizes the importance of family, of community, of industry to the to the nation's liberty and prosperity. And so, you know, what I'd say to everyone out there is if uh, if if you're looking around at, at how economic policy gets done in, in just about any area, we're, we're big into railroad regulation at the moment, <laughs> and you're thinking the sort of you know market fundamentalist dogmas um, that 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 Republicans that conservatives have been mm-hmm. told to adhere to just clearly are not responsive to the problems we have. Um, Compass has been thinking about why that is, what we could do differently, and uh, we would love to work with you on it. Norfolk Southern bombing a small town is not, in fact, the free market working properly. It's I, I wrote <laughs> I wrote a column for for the Financial Times about the uh, the uh, the Railway Safety Act from from Senator Vance. Um, I think Senator Cantwell is the the lead Democrat on it now, and and the head of the <laughs> the 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 head of the uh, American Railway Lobby Association, whatever it's called, wrote a letter to the editor in response in which he literally says, there are no market failures in American railroads. Nice. And that just, <laughs> if you believe that, Clown Godspeed. <laughs> if you think that's probably not right, we are here for you. Orrin, thank you so much. Thank you. This was great. You. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Um, be sure to go back to last week's episode about legal immigration that we did with Oren to uh, find out everything that American Compass has written about on that recently. Be sure to sign up for AM Fridays, our summer lecture series for interns and junior staff. You can do that at AmericanMoment.org. There you can find AmCanon, our coalition of books, essays, podcasts, YouTube videos, and more on a variety of issues. We've assembled them to features that Jake, our chief creative officer, has lovingly curated. You can find the backlog of this podcast. You can rate and review this podcast. Five stars only. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube. We have like two and a half thousand almost uh, YouTube subscribers, completely organic. Be part of that community. See my beautiful face and tie on on camera uh, and especially the beautiful faces of our guests. Um, We spend a lot of money to get this podcast uh, in a a high production value. We put clips out on social media. Be sure to follow us on ammoment.org on all the platforms and be sure to reach out to us on americanmoment.org slash join if you're ever looking for um, advice on career and more here at American Moment. We'll see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more.